Hi, my name is Vanita Blackburn and I'm a professor of fiction here to introduce you to the Fresno State's MFA program showcase of Jacqueline White's thesis, Manuscript Black Magic. Jacqueline's thesis is a sprawling, vast, ambitious work that reaches deep into ancient worlds and anchors itself in modern spaces. There are queens and dragons and video games and bad boyfriends and girlfriends and friendships and maternal fatigue. Jacqueline begins with one of those ancient worlds in which a newborn baby is showered with special gifts. It reads, I will give them quiet so they will know peace. I will give them greed so they will never fall prey to a life of satisfaction. The book is like a magician's hat, full of wonder despite the familiarity. Each new page is like putting your arm into a portal to a new world with a treasure on the other side. From my first class together, I knew Jacqueline had a panoramic imagination, limitless, and eager to see more than the rest of us are accustomed to. Even as characters in the thesis muse over our modern concerns like blackness, queerness, and sometimes Batman, there is a lovely softness to the prose. One section says, quote, bullfrogs croaked out a song as they sat on lily pads. Cattails waved in the wind. Dragonflies skimmed the water. Caterpillars slowly made their way along the stalks of plants. And there were flowers everywhere of every color. Little wildflowers that looked like ants beside their larger cousins. Tulip bulbs in bright colorful clusters keeping their secrets close to the body. Bushes of roses, composed and elegant, opening like the pages of books and waiting to be read. The girl crept on soft feet closer to the bush to get a better look. That is the magician's hand at work. So the future for Jacqueline's work is wild and serene. So let us get a better look as I introduce you to Jacqueline White. Hello, my name is Jay Noel. I am a student of the Fresno State MFA program in creative writing. I would like to take the time to thank the creative writing program, my committee, Vanita Blackburn, Rhonda Gerard, and Bryn Saito, my fellow cohorts and workshop partners, with a special shout out to Caroline Mata. Uh, I'd like to uh, also send a shout out to Brian Medina of the Beatdown Slam, and most importantly, my wife, who has been with me every step of the way, uh, encouraging me and convincing me to do better. I'd also like to acknowledge my best friend, Gloria Hollins, who has always been my biggest supporter and fan and who has always been willing to let me tell her about whatever new story idea I have. And I would like to acknowledge my mom, who even when we didn't necessarily understand each other, she always understood how important writing has meant to me. I can't say that I have ever known myself to not be a storyteller. As soon as I learned that a writer was something that a person could be, I knew that that was what I wanted to spend my life doing. I had a plan to go to law school uh, so that I could make enough money to uh, be able to write independently without having uh, to do any work. That didn't work out because life does not work out the way that you planned it. And so I convinced myself that writing was just a hobby. And then I started watching a show called Jane the Virgin, um, where uh, the main character's love interest convinces her to be brave. And I decided that I wanted to be brave, and I thank Fresno State and the MFA program for allowing me to be brave and pursue um, my dreams. Uh, Black Magic, which is my um, thesis, is a novel that mixes fantasy and fiction and uses poetry to tie the two uh, parts together with a nice little bow. One of the most challenging parts that I've had writing it was the realization that I couldn't just write Valley's character and remain removed from her. Valley's story is my story. It's a story a lot of women share, especially a lot of black women. It's a uh, Black magic is a cultural examination of the many ways that black girls are forced to become magical. The excerpt that I'm going to read to you is from a section called Of Gods and Dads. Thank you. 
I first learned worship at the altar of my father, a devout Catholic but a C&E dad. Christmas to emphasize that progeny are born in the image of the father, that this sacrifice in the name of a child was on this day branded with his name, raised under the expectations to honor him with, his re with reverence even in his absence, Easter, to remind that even the son of God wasn't good enough to keep his father in his life. So how could I expect mine to stick around? He will never be the divine and I fall short of perfection. Men abandon their families to make themselves into the gods of their children's worlds. Mythological creatures conjured in the dead of night to explain away natural phenomenon beyond our comprehension, like eternity and love. They keep little girls stuck, broken on their knees, turn them pray, praying eternally to an unknown in hopes of receiving answers that are just as empty as the silences that follow the utterance, Our Father. Men take their disappointments, parse them onto living corpses, paint them into commandments, command that they be followed in their absence, absently, absently lay foundations for the next generation to form their mouths into this same learned holy expressions to reinforce that love is wrapped up in pain we aren't meant to know the will of god only to bend to it unquestionably take him into our hearts and our beds the sin is in the satisfaction boys grow into the image of the father girls are left to convince them that they are worthy of worship their own worth lies in the opportunity to womb holy the beautific over their bodies they chant, hear me, Lord, and mean father, your father, my father, our father, divine, blessedly revered, eternally hallowed. May we sinners prove worthy of thy grace now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the beginning, there was man. From the multitudes, he chose a goodly woman to be his wife, and she dutifully dutifully gave birth to a child, a girl, born from his seed. And it was good. They lived together at 2455 New Haven Drive in a blue house on a quiet little tree-lined cul-de-sac, the oldest street in a new de housing development. Monday through Friday, the man, Mr. Humphreys, like all the men on the cul-de-sac, except for Mr. Sanderson, who was retired, rose in the morning dressed in black dress slacks, a clean button-up shirt, and a solid colored tie to go to work. In the evening, he came back home to dinner with his family. On Saturdays, they went to the park. On Sundays, they went to church and gave praise to God for his abundance. Life was predictable, so much so that the children in the neighborhood knew each family schedule. They knew when they would eat meals, when they would go to school, to church, where they would go on weekends and vacations. The little box houses, like the little box people, differed very little from each other. Black trim on storm windows instead of white, yellow, white, shale, or blue siding. There were even two little boys named Chris, Christopher Douglas, known as Little Chris, and Christopher Benson, Big Chris. They were even the same age, only their personalities differed. Big Chris barreled through the world. He was all energy without imagination. He needed someone else to get him started, but once he was in motion, he didn't know how to stop. His face was angular and sharp, his smile quick and mischievous. His clothes were brightly colored t-shirts or tanks, either paired with equally brightly colored shorts or a pair of jeans, except when he was forced into slacks and a nice shirt on Sundays. His hair was like him, spiky chaos going in every direction. He and his little brother, Seth, lived in the yellow and white two-story with Mrs. Mr. Benson and Sherry. Little Chris was seriousness and structure. He liked to take his time to think out what he was going to do. He liked to be flawless in his executions. He was chubby, boasting rounded cheeks with an equally rounded waist. His hair was kept short and was, like his clothes, well-groomed and a little old-fashioned. Like Valley, he was an only child. Early in the morning, shortly after Mr. Humphreys left, there was a knock on the door followed by one of the boys' voices inquiring, Can Valley come out to play? Usually the answer was yes, and the girl was left was fit into a dress and released out to her requesters. 
It was on this quiet little cult. It was on this quiet little tree-lined cul-de-sac that five-year-old Valley first learned she was black. She and Big Chris were playing in the space between the Douglases and the Benson's houses when the Douglases' silver Subaru station wagon came rolling to a stop in front of their single-story home. Hey, little Chris! Valley and Big Chris shouted eagerly. Mrs. Douglas went inside while little Chris stayed behind. He had news and he was eager to share it. Hey, guess what? Guess what? If he was excited, Valley knew it was something worthy of being excited about. They made futile glances guesses until he clued them in. I'm going to be, have a little sister. The next day, when little Chris and his mom were getting out of their station wagon, Big Chris said to Mrs. Douglas, Congrats on your tar, baby! Mrs. Douglas's face darkened, shrinking into herself. She tugged on little Chris's arm, towing him towards the house. She stopped suddenly in the middle of her stride. Turning, she marched back to where they were, standing right in front of Big Chris, glaring down at him in a way only a mother could. Young man, that is unacceptable language. You should be ashamed of yourself. Even though he was too big to be picked up, she lifted little Chris into her arms and carted him away. When they were gone, Valley stamped her foot at Big Chris. Little Chris had the best toys, and now, he wouldn't be, and now they wouldn't be able to play with him, or him, today. What did you say that for? Big Chris looked startled. What? That's what black women have. Valley knew nothing of black, and she knew little about where babies came from. So she accepted that Big Chris, who was a few months older than she was, possibly knew something that she didn't. She let him be right in the moment, and they went back to playing whatever game they were playing. Mrs. Douglas called Mrs. Benson, and Mrs. Benson came outside. A thin, light purple sweater fitted over a scoop neck yellow shirt, even though it was muggy and hot and everyone else was wearing lighter clothes. Mrs. Benson was the youngest of the mothers. She didn't do things like everyone else did. She insisted that the kids call her by her first name, Sherry, even though Valley's dad burned, banned her from doing so. Adults are not the same as children, and he didn't want her to think of them as the same. She was as kind and gracious as, Mrs. Benson, as Mr. Benson was mean and overbearing. She strode purposely up to Big Chris, no nonsense coiled in her muscles and written across her face. I just got off the phone with Harriet. What on earth did you say? Big Chris knew the look, knew he was in trouble. Little Chris said that he's getting a baby sister. I just told them I was excited about meeting their tar baby. The color washed from her face. Where did you hear that kind of language? That's what daddy says black women have. He was defense... He was defensive the second time around. The color on his cheeks took on a sheen, a pale pink dusting appearing on his young boyish face to complement his long lashes and pronounced frown. The sooner you learn not to go around repeating what your dad says, the better. His words are mean-spirited and hurtful. You will apologize to both Valley and Chris for saying them. His foot came down against the earth in protest. That's not fair! Sherry was not impressed with this display. She placed a hand on each hip, glowering down at her son. Immediately, young man. Chris looked at Valley like he hated her. He puffed up as big as a bullfrog. Sorry. And mean it. He huffed out. I didn't mean to say something mean. Valley accepted his apology without understanding why she was being given it. The mean thing he said was directed at little Chris and Mrs. Douglas. So how did that relate to her? Sherry wasn't done. There's no such thing as black people and white people. People are just people. Skin is just pigment. She pointed to the will of his power will. You see that? You see your will? That's black. Is Valley that color? Big Chris looked her over, comparing the two things. He bit down on his lip. No. Valley looked too and realized for the first time that the mean thing he said to Mrs. Douglas was related to how they, Valley included, looked. Sherry stood up against the white siding of their house. This is white. Am I white? Valley looked at the contrast between Sherry and the wall. They weren't even close to the same color. The closest Valley could come up with to describe Sherry's skin was that she was the color of a peach, but a white peach, the kind that had a pink tinge around the pit. Sherry's skin didn't just stay one color either. In the winter, it got lighter. In the summer, it got darker and made her face a mess of freckles, and sometimes it became this 
bluish purple color in spots and but only in some places, like her upper arms are around her eyes. Then it would turn yellow-green until it disappeared completely beneath her normal color, or a pair of sunglasses. No, they both said at the same time. You two are friends, and friends don't say things that to hurt each other, no matter what their dad says. The next time she knocked on little Chris's door, his mom answered warily, relaxing when she saw it was Valley. Hi, Mrs. Douglas. Can little Chris come out to play? She said nothing, just disappeared back into the house. Moments later, little Chris appeared in the doorway, looking downtrodden, fist shoved into his tan corduroy pants. My mom doesn't like it when people call me little Chris, he said immediately. He didn't. She didn't know what the problem was. He was little Chris because the Douglases lived in the littler house while the Bensons lived in one of the two two-story houses. He'd always been little Chris. She says, I can only play with you if you're not playing with Chris. The alternative was not being able to play with him at all, which wasn't acceptable. So she split her time between the two Chris's. She played with big Chris outside and she played with little Chris inside because Mrs. Douglas would only let her, her son out when she was around to make sure that he didn't wander across the invisible line that was drawn between them. The months passed and the little lesson was forgotten until it was replaced by an even bigger one. At dinner one night, Valley wondered, what's Snappy mean? It was like an earthquake had erupted beneath her mother's feet. She shook in place, anger, anger rippling from her toe to head. Where did you hear that word? It was a demand, hard and biting. Valley instinctively knew she had said a bad thing. Bracing herself for the impact, she answered, Big Chris said my hair was nappy. He said what? She was thrown by the sound of her father's voice, unnaturally loud and booming. Valley repeated what Big Chris said. Like a stop-motion claymation, she watched as his anger grew, a slow, a slow moving storm ready to rip apart everything that crossed its path. She puffed up beside him, thinking he was going to march across the cul-de-sac to the Bensons, even in the middle of their dinner. She was ready to march there with him, the two of them standing together in solidarity as father glared down at Big Chris and set him straight the way Mrs. Douglas had. This time, she wouldn't accept his apology so readily, not now when the mean thing that thing was directly said to her. With vigor, she would say no to his apology and only part with the other and only play with the other Chris or even Susie, her older next door neighbor every single day until, for a whole week until Big Chris learned his lesson. But her father didn't march across the street. He went into his office and closed the door. He didn't say anything to Big Chris the next day either. The next time she saw Big Chris, he was just as smug and boisterous as he always was. She played with him from a distance. Even when they were only a few feet apart, she never allowed herself to get too close, her mind ready to dance away from anything mean he had to say. But she forgot that Chris's actions came with a lesson. This time, it wasn't handed down from Sherry, but her own mom. Days later, Mrs. Humphreys brought home hot irons. Valley was sat in a chair in front of the counter, towel wrapped around her neck. She watched the blue flames turn the metal of the combs red hot. Transfixed by this piece of magic, she watched until her mom lifted the hot golden comb off the stove, covering the space between the two of them. Her first instinct, flight. Her mom grabbed her around her neck before she could get away, sent her back formally in her chair with the admonishment, sit still. Valley sat. She tried to be still. Because she wasn't allowed to move her body, she sent every part of her away to different corners of the room to find the safest place to hide. From behind the curtain, one eye closed. From underneath the couch, the other. Maybe it was like a shot. If she didn't know when it was coming, it wouldn't hurt so much upon its delivery. She felt the warmth getting closer and closer to her body like a beast breathing down her neck. The strand of hair that her mom parted sizzled and burned when the comb touched it. From under the carpet, her nose smelled scalded flesh, reaching it seconds after the heat touched her skin. From the dustpan, her ears buried themselves beneath the trash, trying to escape the burn. Valley cried. Her tongue, hidden under the door jam close to her father's office, brought him out of its death. What's the noise, he demanded. It hurts, she whimpered. 
A stern look was directed to her mom. There was no compassion in his eyes. This was a punishment commanded from up high to be carried out by her mom, and she had disobeyed him. Keep it down. I'm working. She appealed to his mercy. I'm trying. She's so young. The prayers fell against dead ears. She's going to live her whole life in this world. She needs to learn sooner or later. No one's going to call my child nappy-headed. Finally, she knew what brought on this punishment. Nappy. It wasn't Big Chris who was wrong. It was her. And the punishment for her transgressions was blue magic and hot fire. The final lesson was learned a week after she turned six. For her birthday that year, Valley got a new bike. She and Susie vowed to spend the whole day breaking it in, but Big Chris didn't like that she was choosing to play with Susie instead of him. Why are you playing with stupid little Susie, he demanded. She's not stupid, and we're having fun. I want to play soldier. Go get your bike. Uh, go put your bike up. Dad got Seth and me Nerf guns. Nerf guns were pretty much the coolest thing in the world, but Valley was nothing if not loyal. I'm not going to play soldier right now, she insisted. Susie and I are riding bikes. I don't want to ride bikes. Well, that's what we're doing. She could see him getting worked up into... Uh, she could see him getting worked up. You're my friend, not Susie's. She can play with her own friends. Tell her you're going to play soldier. No. Tell her. No. He huffed and looked around his eyes landing on a stick. She thought nothing of it when he picked it up. A stick could be anything, a sword, a wand, a crutch, a hockey stick, a sundial, a machine part. Before they named it, it was just a fallen piece of tree waiting for instruction on what it would become next. He made it a bat. The transformation happened too quickly for her to react. His arm was a blur, swinging his weapon so hard it broke against her body, the two halves falling to the ground around her. Valley was stunned. She didn't know what was worse, the pain or the shock. Then there were tears. They were as sudden as his attack. I'm telling your mom! Valley shook her head, indignant and outraged. Oh, Big Chris looked frightened. No, I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry. Valley shook her head, indignant and outraged. You hit me. Not on purpose. She knew it was a lie. She watched him, seeing the thoughts play, playing out behind his eyes. There was no truer fact. Yes, it was. She wouldn't cry in front of him. She wouldn't give him the satisfaction. She swallowed the tears, feeling them burn their way down her throat to settle in her belly. She powered her feet. He rushed to get in front of her, holding hands out, palms up. I said I'm sorry. She vowed to never forgive him. You weren't supposed to hit. When you did things that you weren't supposed to do, you had to be punished. He needed to learn he couldn't do that again. She set off to tell Sherry. She'd teach Big Chris right once and for all. Big Chris, seeing that she was serious about tattling, ran for his power will. She thought that she was she thought he was speeding home to get there before her. So she was shocked when he moved the thing forward, running over her new bike. The dam burst, the tears no longer being able to be held at bay as her anger and frustration aimed her eyes at her beautiful new bike. Why did you do that? He was angry and crying too. I said I was sorry. If I say I'm sorry, you're supposed to forgive me. When her dad saw her new bike had a broken frame, he yelled at her. Money doesn't grow on trees, young lady. I work hard to provide nice things. If you're not going to take care of the things you're given, you won't be given nice things anymore. Valley started to tell him the, the real story, but then decided against it. It didn't matter. Chris's story was more important than her own. He could be mean. He could break her things. He could even hit her, and there was nothing she could do about it. Because if Chris was no longer allowed to play outside with them, and she was forced under hot rods simply from his words. She had no idea what punishment awaited her as penance for his actions.